Good morning, everyone. This is unsupervised learning two, oops, which is so obviously the second lecture on unsupervised learning of the course, and it happens to be the last lecture of the course also. Uh, congratulations for those of you who managed to stay alive until now and, and managed to follow it because it's, um, you know, I know, we know it's quite, quite a lot of stuff quite a lot of heavy stuff, um, but it was made with a lot of care and a lot of love <laughs> by us. And I hope you, you, I mean, I hope you've learned something interesting and I hope you still learn something interesting today. But anyway, just the fact that you made it all the way here is, um, is good, is, is a good, good sign. So dimensionality reduction, second unsupervised learning after clustering, second, uh, let's say main type of, um, unsupervised learning after clustering which we saw last week. Uh, I won't, I will not discuss today anything about the let's say supervised versus unsupervised because we did it already last week so if you're if you if you don't remember or if you want to refresh then you can look at the first video from last week which is the introduction plus k-means. But yeah, dimensionality reduction. Actually, the, in this slide, it's inverted. I don't know why, but yeah. So what's the, what's the point of dimensionality reduction? What is it and why does it exist and why is it interesting? The main reason, or one of the main reasons that we use dimensionality reduction is this thing that people are usually regard as being the curse of dimensionality, right? So <clears throat> the curse of dimensionality has many, many definitions. This is mine. I came up with it two years ago. So things get weird in high dimensional spaces. <clears throat> this is of course a very, uh, just a joke, but it's actually true. Um, <clears throat> when, when at the more, the higher the dimensionality of your data set, the more features you have, let's say, when I, one clarification, when I talk about dimensions, I'm say, it's the, the same thing as features for, for us, okay? Uh, let, let's just consider them. That could be dif differences and some, some people who are more strict might differentiate. But for all purposes in this lecture, when I talk about dimensions and features, they're basically the same thing, okay? So <laughs> the more features you have or the more dimensions you have in your data, the way that uh, things work in this in this high dimensional spaces start to get a little bit weird, especially when you're looking at <clears throat> similarity between uh, data instances, right? So like for example, Euclidean distance. When you compute the Euclidean distance in, in 2D or in 3D, then in 100D or in 1000D, then some things that you may, that you, maybe you expect uh, some behavior that you expect from the experience that you have in 2D and in 3D may not hold in high dimensions. And then what happens is that it becomes harder for algorithms to learn about data patterns when, when you have too many dimensions because maybe your algorithm is based on, let's say, assumptions from the Euclidean distance, which may not hold in high dimensional spaces. Let me see if I can uh, make that a little bit clearer with an example. Very simple example. The links of all the figures and things that I use in the lecture are always on the right side of the, <clears throat> on the right side of the slide, if you're curious and you wanna follow up on that. So what, what's, what is this picture telling you? Suppose you have one dimension, right? So that's the, the example to the left. And, and this is about like, oh, it's a bunch of uh, features of, of cats and dogs, let's say. So it's uh, some kind of a measurement of animals that happen to be cats, cats or dogs. And then you're trying to differentiate between cats or dogs, right? So like, like it's a very simple machine learning problem. You have some features on cats and dogs and you want to differentiate between cats and dogs, right? But they could be figures or images as is the common, but it, but it could be also simply like features that were measured from these animals, doesn't matter. Any kind of features, right? whether they come from images or not, doesn't matter. So let's, uh, let's consider the first one on the left. So let's say you have one feature for each data instance, right? So you measured something in many animals, which happen to be either cats or dogs, like, I don't know, 
height, uh, or not even height, but let's say length or however you measure. I never measured an animal before. So let's say length. And then you measured it for, I don't know, a bunch of animals. Um, mathematically speaking, if you wanted to cover 20% of the feature range, let's say you wanted to take as many samples as possible from the whole population of cats and dogs in the world, let's say, and you wanted these, these samples to be representative, right? You want the samples to represent in a good way the, let's say, all the variability that exists in, these, in this uh, space of animals. In order to cover 20% of this, the possibilities of everything that, is, that exists in the, in, in the feature space, you would need 20% of the cats and dogs in the world, let's say. So if you, if you happened to sample 20% of all the cats and dogs in, in, that exist in the world, then you would add, well, you could say, well, okay, I, I've covered 20% of the possibilities of my feature space, right? Because you just have one feature. Now, suppose now you have, you have two features. So suppose that, you're, that you just uh, measured like height and, or sorry, length, as we said, and then you measured also the weight of the animals, right? So you have length and weight for a bunch of cats and dogs. Now, we're all, of course, we're all talking uh, theoretically here, right? Now, suppose you still want this to cover 20% of all the feature space that you have, but now you have two features. So, so you, have, you want to cover all the possible combinations of these two features that exist in the world, right? Or not exist in the world, but I mean, uh, theoretically speaking. You might think, well, you know, if I sample 20% of all the possible heights or all the possible lengths of, van of cats and dogs in the world and 20% of all the possible weights of cats in the world uh, and, and dogs, then you would be covering 20% of the feature space. But that would not be true. Actually, in order to cover 20% of the feature space, you would need to, act to sample 45% of each of the features. And that is because, as you can see here in this slide, the combinations of the two features, they form a square. Right, and this square has an area, and this area represents all the possible combinations of, let's say, lengths and weights that could possibly exist for cats and dogs. Between, I, I put it here like zero and one, but it's just like between the minimum and the maximum of whatever is that feature possible uh, exists, and the, the same thing for the y-axis. And in order to co cover twenty percent of the area of this square, you would need a, a little uh, sample here that has actually 45% of each feature sampled. So it's not 20% anymore. And that's because, of the, that's because of how the area works, right? You want, you're covering, you want to cover 20% of the area of all possible features, not, not just each feature independently anymore. And things just get worse and worse. So for example, if you now had three features, so you maybe measured the length, the weight, and then you measured also the color or whatever definition you could measure, or whatever color you could measure from the dog. Of course, they have many colors, but let's say just like the, the most, the color that is the largest one or something. It doesn't matter, three features. Then again, if you say, okay, I want to cover all the, uh, I want to cover 20%, at least 20% of all the possible combinations of these three features in order to have a good sample. Then again, instead of uh, uh, sampling like 20% of each feature, you would, you would actually have to sample 58% of all the possible values of, of uh, the three features. And then again, that's because in order to cover 20% of the area of this cube that, that is formed, let's say, by having three features, you would have to have three, uh, you have, have a, a smaller cube with the, where, where the side of this cube is actually 58% of the larger, larger one. So that's, that, that gets worse and worse and worse as we go. And uh, yeah, so this is what, what I was ta talking about. If, if you want to cover 20% of the feature space, then of course in one dimension it's just 20% of the population, but as you, as you go up, then it becomes harder and harder. And actually, 
for example, if you only had uh, 20 features, which is like not much, uh, you've, you've worked with much more than that uh, in, during the course, you would need more than 90% of the date of all the possible data instances in the world just to cover 20% uh, of the, um, of the, theoretical possibilities of the feature space, right? Because it's a combinatorial explosion, right? Every time you add a new feature, then it becomes larger and larger, but exponentially, not, not, uh, it, it's not um, linearly, okay? So the, the, the point that I'm trying to make here is, uh, the, the more features you have, the harder it is for a classifier to, to, have, to, to work because the amount of data that you have gets less and less representative. So it's one thing to have, I don't know, a thousand data instances or even 10,000 data instances. If you have two or three features, that is one thing because, because these, maybe these 10,000 features or, or whatever are data instances, they are good enough for three features. They, they represent a good enough sample that you can analyze this sample and have a good idea of how the data set or the population, the unknown population works in general. Because you know, this, this 1,000 or 10,000 data instances that you have, they're actually a good representative sample. But if you have more and more and more features, then this, this, this 10,000 points that you have, they become less representative because they cannot cover all the possible combinations of features that exist when you have 20 or 100 dimensions. Because it's just so much, so, so, so many possibilities of combinations between the different features that you simply, that those 10,000 data points that you have, they simply cannot cover all of it, right? And that decreases classifier accuracy or it decreases, it decreases actually any kind of uh, accuracy or of any algorithm that's trying to learn from the data, right? Simply because the, the model that you, that you have is not representative enough. Uh, you don't have enough data to cover the whole thing. So one, one solution, of course, would be, well, let's just take more data. So let's just get more samples and more and more and more samples because the more samples you have, the more, the, the better is, is going to be your, your model because there's more data to learn from. However, it, it's not practical, especially if you go to like a hundred dimensions or a thousand dimensions. And that, that's, that's something that's very easy to happen. Like for example, when you're learning from images and uh, it's very common to use the pixels as being features, right? Then I don't know if you have a, a small a small um, figure per data instances. Let's say like 100 by 100 pixels, which is very small, right? Uh, you already have 10,000 features. So how do you deal with the, ex com the, the explosion of possible uh, things that can that can come from having like 10,000 features? You could never ever possibly sample enough of the population that would cover uh, a good, that would represent like a theoretically good sample for 10,000 features. That would be, I would say that would be practically impossible. So, and, and anyway, sometimes, you, you, well, you simply cannot get more data. Like you have the data that you have and you don't have any possibility to get more data. So, so that's not an option anyway, even if you had, last features you have just 10 or 20 or 100 features you just most of the time i'd say probably getting more data is not even a, an option even if you could uh, or even if it would uh, be possible or if it would help you so you couldn't anyway so the solution is then well if i cannot get more data then i should shrink my feature space because with less features I have less problems with the curse of dimensionality because the curse of dimensionality gets worse and worse and worse the more features we have. So if I have a certain amount of data points, I cannot get more data points. So what, why not then reduce the number of features in order to reduce the effect of the curse of dimensionality and then maybe I get better results, right? So uh, this is interesting here. It's just an example again that from, from, the, um, from this link to the right, where it shows here that, you know, 
uh, you have classifier performance on the y-axis and you have number of features in the x-axis. And then it's just, a, it's just an example that the more you increase the dimensionality, of course, if you have zero dimensions, then that makes no sense. But if you have uh, one or, or two dimensions for this specific problem, and we will discuss why later, for this specific problem, the classifier goes up the more features you add to the thing. But then after a while, it starts to get down again because the classifier simply cannot deal with so much data. Uh, and and it, cannot, it cannot really learn uh, in enough patterns from so much feature, from a feature space that has so much features. So then the classifier uh, decreases performance. It's just, an, uh, let's say, a theoretical example that there should be some kind of um, a point where, okay, this is the perfect or the optimal dimensionality for this data set. And anything more than this uh, actually just works to add more noise and more uh, problems to the classifier instead of actually uh, helping the classifier become better and better, right? Especially when you think about generalization. So it's not just about learning from the data you have and then being good at the data that you have, right? You know, you, you've, you've done cross-validation a million times before, so you know that the, a model is not good because it learns, it, it can, uh, you know, detect the, let's say, the classes from the data that you have. It has to be general enough to, to, to be good with external data. So, so that's also, that's what the problem, that, that's one of the problems. And anyway, the, 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 the point, the core here is this, if you cannot get more data, and you want to fight the curse of dimensionality, then you can shrink the feature space and have less features so that you avoid this, this problem with this combinatorial explosion. And feature selection is one alternative, right? You can start removing features. Like, oh, this, this one feature here, this one column of my matrix, I kind of, it doesn't help me a lot, so I just remove it. And then I find another one, I find another one until, until I get, I, I I keep only a couple of them that are, um, let's say, the best for the problem at hand. But sometimes the data has lower intrinsic dimensionality. Uh, so, for example, look at this thing, these two things. They're very classic examples of uh, a manifold, as we as we call it. I don't remember if you've seen anything around about this in previous lectures, because you know the lectures change uh, and I'm not super involved with the previous lectures on uh, supervised learning. So I don't remember if there was anything about manifolds, but uh, I will assume not. And, and anyway, I'm not gonna talk too much about it, but uh, a manifold is, is, is this kind of structure that you can detect in a, in a space uh, of a certain dimensionality, but the manifold itself has intrinsic lower dimensionality. So it's like, uh, it's like if you have a plane, which is 2D, like a sheet of paper or I don't know, a card like, like this. This is, let's say this, of course this is not 2D, <laughs> this is 3D, but let's say it, it's, it's so thin that we consider it as being a 2D uh, manifold, but it's embedded in 3D, right? Like I can move it around like this, uh, and I can see it on the back, on the front and everything. So it's embedded in a 3D world, but you could actually kind of uh, like describe it as a, t as a 2D object. So if you just, just put it somewhere like this and I just draw it on a screen, I'm seeing, I would, I would see a very good representation of this because it's inherently two dimensional, but it's embedded in this 3D world. So this, this idea, that some data sets have lower intrinsic dimensionality than their actual dimensionality that we, that we have access to is the idea of fighting the, is, is, is the idea behind fighting the curse of dimensionality by not by removing features, but by combining them in such a way that the final features that are less than the original ones are not simply a, a subset of the original ones that you just removed some and just kept some. They are actually a combination of everything that came before in such, in such a smart way that the final lower dimensionality is representative 
of the lower intrinsic dimensionality that the data set had in the first place. So for example, take this, this, this Swiss row as we call it, right? This it's obviously 3D, right? Uh, it's, it's in 3D that we see that, I can see this like here, it's a 3D thing, but it has a lower intrinsic dimensionality because if you unroll it like, like a rug, for example, think of it as a rug that is rolled on, upon itself. If you unroll it, then it becomes basically a 2D plane, right? So you could, you could consider it as being a 2D manifold embedded in a 3D world that you then could, if you could unroll it, probably you would have a better representation of what this, um, of what this Swiss roll is actually like. And then we're gonna come back to this later actually. Same thing for, the, for this, what we call the S curve, right? Again, if you consider it as being some kind of a plane that's distorted a little bit, if you just straight it up, then you have a rug or, or, or a 2D thing that was actually just embedded in a 3D world. So if we could somehow take this high dimensional representations that we have and somehow learn this, somehow extract this lower dimensionality, lower dimension structures from the high dimensions, then we could learn from this data set more or less with the same accuracy that we had before, but, but since we, we have less features, then we fight the curse of dimensionality, okay? Uh, this will, uh, let's see, I will, I will talk about like, many different ways to do this uh, as we go, and I hope it becomes a little bit clearer as we go. So yeah, this is dimensionality reduction. The name says we are reducing the dimensionality of a data set, right? Uh, and the idea is that we do this without losing too much information, right? Of course. And that's why it's, uh, it's usually, I think, it's hard to say better, but it's, it's, in, in some cases, it's better than just, just removing features because if you remove features, then you're actually losing a lot of information. On the other hand, if you, just, if you combine the features into a smaller number of features, then you can do this in a smarter way uh, that you don't lose a lot of uh, information. You can think of it a little bit like compressing images or compressing video, right? You want to compress the video, you want to have a smaller video, but you also want to still, the video should still look good, right? And that's the, that's the idea behind like whatever uh, algorithm that they use nowadays, I don't remember anymore, but you know, it used to be for images, J, JPEG, for example, was a big game changer when it came out, like, I don't know, 30 years ago, uh, because it's, it was such a good uh, way to compress the images. They are very small, but you could also con control the quality and so on. So uh, th this is the idea. The idea is that it's a smart compression of your data, okay? instead of just throwing away features and then losing information, right? So you can think of dimensionality reduction for a very, if you want to think of it as a, as a very simple abstraction, think of it as a function. The function takes as input your entire data set. So let's say your input data set has N data instances. So these are the rows of the matrix and P dimensions or features, which are the columns of a matrix. Then you put it into DR, and then what you get what you get out of it is again n. So you can see that th this ma uh, matrix has the same number of rows as this one, so they're both n because you don't lose data points in the process. Okay, the data points stay the same, but you have less dimensions or less features. So you have q uh, dimensions or features, and q is much less than p, right? So in this case, for example, it's four, while the original one was 10. So we went from 10 to 4. So the input is, is kind of this matrix with n, n elements and p, p features, and the output has the same number of rows, but much less features. So the, the key point here is what's happening inside this thing here, right? What is this function? What are the algorithms that are being used here? And it's a kind of a learning, also, it's a, it's a kind of an unsupervised learning because we're not learning we're not learning to, to classify things. We're not learning, we're not creating models to differentiate between labels. We're, we're trying to create a model here that retains as much information as possible from the original thing, but with less features, okay? Uh, 
And then there are many goals that you can, that you can uh, try to achieve with this. There's not just, it's not just a thing where you have one silver bullet that solves everything uh, and, and that's it, right? Um, although there are some techniques that are much, much more well-known and much more uh, widely used than others. So they can be kind of thought of as silver bullets, but they're not because there are many different things you, you may want to achieve with dimensionality reduction. In general, it is you want to map high dimensional data onto lower dimensional representations, of course. And in general, obviously, you want to preserve some kind of a property as much as possible, because what would be the point? Like, you, you, of course, the, 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 the smaller representation should be um, still a good data set to learn from. But exactly what you're trying to optimize could be covariances, for example. So you, have, you want to retain the same covariances from the original data set into the final data set. Or you may want to um, preserve distances. So you want, for example, you know, I will go from 100 to, to, to I don't know, two or three dimensions, but I want the distances between the points to remain very similar. So I, I don't want these to be distorted so much. I want their, their distances to be preserved as much as possible. Uh, and there are ways to do that. Um, you, want, you may want to preserve neighborhoods instead of distances. So you, you may want to say, okay, look, I do want the distances from point to points to be kept, but I, I don't care too much about points that are very, very far away from each other because they, they're not related. However, if I take a point and I look at the first 10 neighbors or 20 neighbors, for example, like the, those points that are very close together, these points, I want them to be very well represented in the final results, for example. So that's, that's one way to add a trade-off to this optimization so that you can actually let the algorithm throw away some, some stuff because, you know, points that are too far away from each other, you know, they don't really matter. Like their, their relationships don't really matter. So that's a way to add a trade-off to the whole algorithm and say, look, in this case, you can just throw it away and I don't care too much about this. You may also be, uh, want to preserve clustering, for example. You can say, okay, uh, if there are clusters in the original data set, I want the clusters to still be there in the final data set. Even though we have less features, I want the clusters to be maintained, for example. Uh, and, and the point here that I want to, to bring to you is that there's almost always error. It's like, again, it's like a JPEG, okay? The JPEG is never a perfect uh, figure, right? It's never the perfect image. Uh, I, I don't think there is any version of the JPEG where you can have lossless compression. I'm, I'm not sure, but I don't think so. Uh, and, but the point is that it is useful anyway. So this, this, I, this is a quote that I really love, which is all models are wrong, but some are useful. So all models are wrong because they're by definition models, they're not reality. Only reality can be, let's say, objectively right in a, in a, in a philosophical sense, right? So every time you make a model of reality, there are errors in this model. There are simplifications and you, you are leaving out a lot of stuff so that your model can actually work and be useful. But all models are wrong. Uh, all models have problems. Uh, it's just that how wrong it is. I mean, you want models that are not that much wrong, but also is it wrong related to what? Because sometimes you, you may accept to be wrong on one thing if you want to be right more or less wrong in another thing. And with the mission reduction reduction is exactly the same. You, you may throw away some kind of a structure from the data set in order to preserve another one that's more interesting for you in that specific, for that specific problem that you're looking for. And we're gonna, we're gonna you know, see a little bit more about that as we go. There are many motivations to do dimensionality reduction. Maybe uh, one that's the most common or something that uh, might, might appeal more to you, let's say, is uh, pre-processing, which is the, to reduce the dimensionality before training a classifier. Again, recursive dimensionality, everything that we've uh, discussed so far, right? Uh, but also, uh, not only it's not only about you know fighting the recursive dimensionality per se, but also more concretely is about you know minimizing impact of outlier variables, for example, 
or confounding factors. So maybe, maybe you have a very noisy data set, right? With a lot of um, extra stuff that should not be there. Uh, because maybe the, 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 the phenomenon or the thing that you're trying to, to model after is actually not like incredibly complex, but then, but for some reason, because you have, I don't know, a hundred sensors measuring a certain uh, behavior of something or a machine or whatever uh, in, in industry, uh, maybe you have a hundred sensors measuring that. And those hundred sensors are all giving you information, but actually the, the phenomenon that they are uh, measuring, the behavior of the machine or the industry machine that you're measuring is not that complex. Maybe you could actually represent that with two or three features. If you knew exactly, <laughs> you know, how, what, what is the, the intrinsic dimensionality of the, the phenomenon that you're measuring, which you don't usually. So, uh, so maybe all these extra 95 uh, features or sensors are just adding information that could be noisy, could have a lot of outliers. Maybe a couple of the sensors are malfunctioning and then they're inputting all kind of kinds of weird values into the process and so on and so forth. So the more sensors you have, of course, the larger the possibility that there will be noise and uh, outlier uh, measurements in your data right so uh, so so this is this is the point here is not just about actually let's say detecting this this structure that's two or three d but also throwing away all these things that are not really significant to the to the thing and uh, and you, you can do that with dimensionality reduction feature engineering is an interesting motivation for dimensionality reduction because maybe uh, you're manually building features for your data, right? Uh, that happens a lot. Um, you, don't, you don't always have, uh, you don't always use the raw data that you get. For example, in, in, in astronomy, which is something that I've, uh, that I've worked with a, a, a group about this, and they have these, all these hundreds of measurements of all kinds of stuff but they, they, don't really, they don't really use all these raw measurements to train their models because it's just a lot of noise and a lot of stuff. So they manually build features that are actually, let's say, functions of the raw data that they get. And these, these functions are, again, manually determined by them from their tacit knowledge, from their domain knowledge of what they're doing, right? Uh, and and uh, dimensionality reduction can be used for you to to go into this testing phase where okay I have these these features that I have that I came up with like four or five or something, and then you can use dimensionality reduction to kind to kind of test if they make sense or not if if the patterns that they are that you're creating with your manual features are actually meaningful for you. Uh, and then there is visualization, which is uh, to explore the data to find patterns that were not initially apparent. So again, if you have a hundred dimensions, then you may you may get curious, like what is what is my um, what is in this data set? Like, are there patterns in it? Are there structures? Are there clusters in this thing? Uh, are there um, I don't know connections between the variables? Uh, so you can use visualization for that. In, in many different ways, but if you had a hundred, if you have a hundred dimensions, then it becomes really, really hard to visualize. Like, how can you visualize a hundred dimensions? How can you visualize even four or five dimensions? Anything above three becomes very hard to visualize. So you can use dimensionality reduction to reduce your your entire features uh, set into smaller feature sets of two or three, for example, and then visualize them directly, like with uh, with the scatter plot, like we did. Uh, over here, for example, this is in this case the data set is actually 3D. But we, but if you had 100 and you put put it down to three, then you can directly uh, visualize it as a scatter plot, and then maybe find some patterns. Who knows? And this is uh, the domain of information visualization. is It's uh, the kind of thing that I work with in my research. So um, I'm not I'm not gonna really talk too much about it because I don't think it matters uh, for this lecture. But I just there's a slide here, and and if if this is something that rings a bell or makes you guys interested, and and you might want uh, to discuss more about applications of machine learning into visualization, which is 
a great, interesting, amazing field right now, uh, you know, back and forth, visualization for machine learning, machine learning for visualization, so on. This is uh, the kind of thing that I do research on. So you can uh, contact me and we can discuss that. And it's, and it's, uh, it's true that our vision, when we look at things, we can detect a lot of stuff that a, that a machine learning model would take, would, would be much harder for, uh, for uh, the, the computer to detect, right? So uh, the vision is, the vision connected to the brain and the processing power uh, that we have is just an amazing thing that, that if, you, if you know the right way to, to deal with that or to, to support that with uh, visualization, then it becomes, um, a great tool, right? Uh, this is just a small example as I, I, as you know, just to spark your curiosity, but it's, um, you know, for example, if you take this data set over here, uh, then we have actually have four data sets here, one, two, three, and four. They're both made of two variables each, X and Y. And the interesting thing here is that if you take these four data sets and let's say, for example, you extracted some features from these data sets, like the mean, the variance, the sample variance, uh, the mean of Y, the sample variance of Y and the correlation and so on. If you took this, these measurements from these data, these four data sets, you would get the exact same values. And these are the values that you get by, uh, if you take the, these measurements. So from, from one, from two, from three, from four, they will all be the exa exactly the same. So if you, if you used these values to explain these data sets, so to speak, to, to summarize these data sets, then you would conclude that they are exactly the same. So you say, okay, these four data sets, they're exactly the same because they have the same mean of X, the same sample variance, the same mean of Y, the same sample variance of Y, so on and so forth. So you could safely, you might think you could safely assume that they're identical or at least very, very similar. And then when you visualize them, just by very, very simply, you don't do anything. You just take X and Y and just build um, a scatter plot and just, just put points in the screen. Immediately, you can obviously realize that they are completely different. So this is why uh, information visualization is an interesting thing. Uh, the power that we have of understanding patterns uh, is um, in many situations much better than the computer. Of course, if you apply a, a more complex algorithm to this, you will say, yeah, of course, the more complex algorithm could very easily detect that. But again, how do you know that if your, if your algorithm is complex or not enough to, of course, this is a simple example, but in more complicated scenarios, how do you know that your algorithm was actually able to capture the complexity of the data set, right? Visualization is one way to, to, to offload this into the human brain and then it becomes more interesting. So let's move on. Uh, this, this is unsupervised learning. Labels are not used when doing the machine learning reduction again, of course, but they may be used for checking the accuracy of the results. So if you do have labels, you may use them on top of the visualization in order to say, okay, actually this thing that the, the, that the dimensionality reduction model learned or, or detected actually fits with what I knew about it from the labels. So, so yeah, that looks good. All right, but, um, but the labels themselves are not used during the process of learning the new features, so to speak. And just a small warning, I guess it doesn't matter to you guys. You have been doing a lot of uh, math stuff anyway for the past months or so. So, but just a warning, I mean, it's gonna come in the next few slides. We're gonna have a lot of, uh, you know, the, mission, uh, the similarity measures, linear algebra, gradient descent, so derivatives and so on. But I, I guess you are, used to it, I hope so. <laughs> 